So welcome back, everyone. I would also like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Janil Puchicheri, Chairman of OnePeople.sg. <laughs> Moving on. Our second panel tries to answer the question, how relevant are ethnic traditions in the construction of ethnic identity? May I invite the moderator, Ms. Susanna Kulatisa, a management committee member of OnePeople.sg, to introduce the panel and speakers. Ms. Kulatisa, please. Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome back from the break. Uh, first, let me introduce our panelists. Um, Mr. Tan Danfeng began as an English-Chinese translator in 1993 and is active in the regional language, translation and publishing sectors. He chairs the annual Singapore International Translation Symposium and has sat on many government committees, including the National Translation Committee. Among the numerous books he has edited or co-edited is Singapore Shifting Boundaries. Today, he's also the co-founder of the Select Centre, a not-for-profit organisation focused on promoting intercultural dialogue. Thank you for joining us this morning, Mr Tan. Also with us is Dr Noor Sharil Saad, a fellow at the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute. In June 2015, he was awarded a PhD in International Political and Strategic Studies by the Australian National University. In that same year, he became the first recipient of the Said Issa Samayat Scholarship. And a large part of uh, Dr. Nosharil's research revolves around Southeast Asian politics and contemporary Islamic thought. His commentaries have appeared in a host of journals, local and international newspapers, such as the Canberra Times, Bangkok Post and the Jakarta Post. And among the books he's published this year is Tradition and Islamic Learning. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Nosharia. Mr. Sashitaran Tirunalan, or T. Sashitaran, or just Sashi to his friends, as many know him, is co founder and director of the Intercultural Theatre Institute. The arts veteran conceived and started the specialised independent actor training school with the late Ko Pao Kun in 2000. Before that, he was the artistic director of Substation, Singapore's only independent arts centre. For more than 40 years, Sashi has worked in theatre as an actor, performer, director and producer. He writes and lectures internationally on art, theatre training, performance practice and Singapore culture. He received the Cultural Medallion, Singapore's highest award for artists in 2012. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning, panellists. Can I just get straight into it and invite our first speaker, Dr. Tan Den Feng. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, um, Susanna, and thank you to IPS for the invitation to speak today. Um, when I got the invitation to speak on this topic, I think you can see, you should be able to see the, the abstract and also see the title. How relevant are ethnic traditions in the construction of ethnic identity? It seemed like a very straightforward question. So I very quickly um, accepted the invitation. But in preparing for today, I realized that things were not as uh, straightforward as that. I realized that Dr. Matthew Matthews had given me a trick question. <laughs> so I had a lot of problems in thinking about what to say. Right? Um, firstly, I think I was caught up with this conundrum, right? What is ethnic tradition? Right? Because when you think about tradition, you think about um, one's ancestry, might not just be Chinese, it could be Teochew or Hokkien or Hainanese. You think about cultural customs, you think about religion, you think about language. Right? So, um, I think Dr. Matthew Matthews has been very helpful in giving an abstract where he uh, gives certain examples, uh, um, uh, ethnic, um, uh, mainly um, arts, for, uh, arts forms and um, 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 uh, uh, cultural practices. So that made it a little bit easier. But still, I couldn't run away from the feeling that we might be pursuing the wrong path, right? When we think about um, one's ethnic identity, um, it seems that we are seeing ancestry, customs, religion, language, art forms, each as a separate component, as separate pillars used to construct our ethnic identity. But as I thought more and more about it, I re did not really feel comfortable with that sort of metaphor, with that kind of model. In fact, I'm start, I started to feel that these are 
separate elements are actually, um, uh, what do you call it? Twines, right? Uh, things that are intertwined to form a rope. A hemp that's intertwined to form a rope. Where everything is interweaved together, inextricably linked and inseparable, right? That means that if you take away one, the rest will weaken, right? And the rope might break, right? Endangering our entire ethnic identity. Uh, you could do a thought experiment. You could think about how um, could we have our Chinese temple practices today without the Chinese language, right? Could we have certain other forms of practices um, uh, without um, uh, um, language? Could we have? Uh, could we practice our religion the same way without? Could we practice our customs the same way? And without our customs, and without our links to language, could we have? Um, other things. So it, when you think about it, you re, I, I mean, at least for me, it started me seeing everything as, as intertwined, right? So it also brought another question to my mind, which is that in the abstract, it pointed to the IPS um, uh, surveys that showed this declining interest in ethnic art forms, right? In that case, do we see this declining interest in ethnic art forms as um, something independent, that something that is just happening, an independent phenomenon, or is that a symptom of an overall decline in ethnicity as an identity marker for Singapore? Right? For many um, scholars, for Max Weber, for example, 100 years ago, um, had already long predicted that ethnicity would decline in importance and eventually vanish as a result of modernization, industrialization, and individualism. Right? So basically, I started wondering, can we only look at traditional um, um, art forms or tradition uh, in an isolated way? Or we, should we be looking at this as a much larger picture? So being a, someone educated in Singapore, I desperately wanted to answer the question. So I used this trick of narrowing the scope. I um, reinterpreted uh, Dr. Matthew's question as, how relevant are ethnic art forms in the construction of ethnic identity? I, in an attempt to answer his question. And even in that narrower form, I ran into some more problems, right? So just now I asked the question, what is ethnic tradition? Now I've run into this problem, what are traditional art forms, right? It's very problematic. Superficially, when you think about traditional art forms, okay, there's nothing complicated about it, right? These are the artistic practices that we were brought over from our ancestral lands, right? But when you think a bit deeper, then that's when all the problems occur. For example, um, I thought immediately of one of the icons of Singapore's traditional art scene, Baskas Arts Academy. I mean, you would have heard of uh, them, a wonderful um, group, right? And been around one of the oldest arts groups in Singapore. Um, if you were to look at them, I'm, and I know uh, Mrs. Baska and uh, the young Mr. Baska extremely well. <laughs> And I, so I, I do hear from them things, they continue to innovate. They've always innovated since their first day in Singapore. Uh, they have gone to um, regional um, competitions or exhibitions of the Bharatana uh, Natyam performances, where instead of dancing the Ramayana or dancing something, they would dance the traditional Bharatana Natyam form, but set to a po an English poem, a Malay poem. Uh, in fact, I think one of their performances where they won a lot of awards was when they um, choreographed an entire Indian dance based on the poetry of Simon Tay. Right? And uh, in fact, they admitted to me that uh, on more than one occasion, uh, the other competitors or the other troops that were performing from Sri Lanka, from Tamil Nadu, would go to the organizers and say, what they're doing is not real. What they're doing is not authentic. Right? How can you allow them to, uh, to, to compete against us? Um, you can also think about another example, maybe the lion dance, right? Lion dance in Singapore, if you know, has won a lot of regional meets, right? The lion dance competitions. And the lion dance form in Singapore is it's very unique, right? It's, it's evolved over a long time, and it was a, a southern form. And what is more, if, you, if you've watched uh, lion dancing over the last Chinese New Year, you'll realize that it's actually very multiracial. I wouldn't be surprised if one day in the near future an award would be given to the best lion uh, dance drummer and that person would be a Malay or an Indian Singaporean. Right? It's entirely conceivable if you look at who, um, who are the ones that are passionate and being involved in lion dancing in Singapore today. Right? So compared to mainland China, Taiwan and the Hong Kong forms of lion dance, the Singapore lion dance is, you can't say that it's any less authentic. In fact, some would argue that it's even more authentic, 
because we, they, they've, they've kept the tradition alive. It's equally good based on the awards that it's won. And so what all these things tells me is that when we think about tradition, right, I, we, it's easy to fall into a trap to see tradition as something that is fixed and unchanging. But I think the best traditions, the best traditional art forms are always evolving. The practitioners are always innovating. Right? And if you look at the Baskas Arts Academy, if you were to look at Singapore Lion Dance, they refuse to allow themselves to be pigeonholed as the possession of just one group. Right? They have gone beyond to become the possession of all Singaporeans. So that brings to my mind the question, at what point in time does the ownership of a traditional art form from our ancestral land pass into the hands of Singapore? When does it become Singapore's own tradition? Is there that point? Right? And if we recognize it as a Singapore art form, a Singapore lion dance, a Singapore Indian dance, then would that make a difference in how much resources we are willing to put in to help it and to promote it? And then I was confronted with this other thought. Isn't all art, all creativity that we practice in Singapore, isn't that all, can, cannot, can we not trace the lineage all the way back to the so-called traditional art forms? For without a grounding in traditional art, the classics, even if it's only at a subconscious level, what sort of creativity can we produce? What sort of creative class can we have? Um, and along these same lines, there was this other thought that came through my mind, which is, I thought was quite important, which is, can we trust that this decline in interest is inevitable and destined? That means that for sure, it would, the um, fall will continue. Because you have experts like Manuel Castells and uh, other observers who are now, uh, um, um, Castells in particular, I mean, he identified the concept of an identity of resistance, right? And this was many years ago, more than 10 years ago, he's already pointed to that, that in an era of cultural homogenization, where globalization is forcing us all to be the same, then you see people, you know, going back and looking for their collective identity back into their own ethnicity, back into something older and something deeper, right? So that has been seen to happen. And if that were to happen one day in Singapore, that we try to go back to what we have to make ourselves more complete, to feed our soul, what is there left for us if we have allowed everything to die off, right? So, yeah, what happens should the day come when we want to recover our roots? Will there be anything left? So, in thinking through these <laughs> many questions, it made me realize how unqualified I was to answer the question posed to me by Dr. Matthew Matthews. Because it's not so simple, right? More than just a technical question on relevance, it's actually a question of what sort of people and society we are and what sort of people or society we want to be, which is why conversations like this, I think it's very important. And in a way, it also made me appreciate the prescience, right, and the wisdom of uh, Singapore's founding um, fathers, right, Singapore's pioneer leaders, something that uh, the keynote speaker today, uh, Mr. Iswaran, alluded to, right? Because when I checked uh, the parliamentary records, the first time this word, cultural ballast, was used in parliament was in 1973. I mean, I'm sure many of you would be familiar with that term. But at the time, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, but also followed very quickly by uh, our cultural minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, introduced the concept of what cultural ballast, right? So what is a ballast? A ballast is, is are the ballast tanks of a ship sailing in waters. And you fill the ballast tank with water or with sand to keep it stable in, 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 uh, in choppy waters, right? And at that time, they said, we needed to have a cultural ballast. Singaporeans need to have a cultural ballast as a defense against Western individualism, Western materialism, and decadence. So we need something in us to bolster ourselves against the choppy waters of, of opening up our borders and becoming a globalized island state. So in, at that time, what did they choose to put within the ballast tank to stabilize Singaporeans? They chose to put as a decision, the far off, the cultures of the far off ancestral civilizations, Chinese culture, right? Indian culture, right? The culture of um, um, uh, the Malay archipelago. So these are the old cultures that we put into our ballast tank to stabilize Singaporeans, right? And the results speak for themselves, right? So they, they saw a real risk and they moved very decisively to, to hit off that risk with what they had on hand. And 
As I mentioned, the results are there for all to see. Now, 53 years later, or 50 years later, I think times have changed, right? So the world is a lot more choppy. Singapore has, uh, well, uh, China and um, um, India, instead of being far off great civilizations, uh, they have um, um, emerged. They have, they, uh, there's a resurgence of the old civilizations, right? We have hyper-globalization. So maybe, really, now is certainly a time for a conversation to start to say, should we relook at our ballast tank? Is Singapore now sufficiently mature that we have something of our own, right? Something that could have a, a, a blend of what was originally here and what our forefathers brought over? Is there something that's uniquely Singaporean that we can use to fill our ballast tank? Because that would be something that would resonate a lot more with, I think, all Singaporeans, right? Um, I would like to end by presenting a metaphor for Singapore cult multiculturalism and one that I hope will become a reality. There was a very good metaphor on uh, uh, multiculturalism that uh, was um, this uh, Mr. Kuo Pao Kun, uh, Singapore's famous playwright, director, and cultural theorist came up with that I've used for years, right? Um, he described multiculturalism as a forest and trees, right? He says if you walk through a forest and you keep your eyes level, all you see are the different trunks of the trees, Chinese, Malay, Tamil, or whatever, others. But if you look down, you will see that the roots all extend into the same ground and they draw the same sustenance, right? That's our commonality. But if you look up, you will see that all the branches actually touch. So we are not separate. And it is where the leaves touch that there's cross-pollination. That's where the life of a forest is. And that's the beauty of multiculturalism, right? I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that was what he said. And it's a very powerful metaphor that I thought only someone who came up from Singapore can think of and then come up with it so uniquely. Um, I've come up with a, a slightly different metaphor, <laughs> which I'm going to, to show. Um, okay. First of all, um, this is a very special painting. It's lost now. Nobody knows where it is. Some people suspect it's in the, um, what they call it, the uh, 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 Forbidden City Museum in China. <laughs> or it's in some collector's home, but it's lost. But this was printed by the famous Singapore painter uh, Lin Mu Hua, Lin Mu Hui. And it's not a scene in China. This is a scene along Old Upper Thompson Road, across from where Lower Pierce Reservoir is. Right? And this is a scene of what they call, um, in Chinese, this place was called Yu Chu Yuan, which some scholars have translated as Silly Fun Garden. But um, it's also called, translated by um, uh, this uh, Professor Lai Chi Kiet, this historian, as the Garden of Foolish Indulgences. It was run by a very unique person, right? Mr. Han Wai Tun, whom I think uh, already uh, scholars have begun studying him as an example of how identity shifts. And he, he's a very, he came to Singapore to be a rubber tapper with very little education. Okay. And then he um, became someone that was respected uh, by everyone. Okay? Every British scholar who travels through here, the curator of the Raffles Museum will point them to see Mr. Lim, this unique man who knows everything. And China eventually invited him to go back to China to be a special advisor to the uh, uh, Forbidden City Museum, right? uh, the China Academy of Sciences, because he became an expert in porcelain, in dating porcelain. And I have met the granddaughter and, who grew up with him, and what was surprising to me was that the granddaughter told me he didn't speak English and he didn't speak Mandarin. He only spoke Malay and he spoke Hainanese. Right? So how did he communicate? Can you imagine the, the, how special this person was? But I'm not going to talk about him, although it will take the whole day. But I wanted to talk about his Rambutan farm. Because in the old days, he, I mean, he ran this as a real farm. And it commanded the highest prices. All the fruit vendors in Geylang and all that will go and pay extra premium to buy his um, Rambutans. Because they're so sweet, right? And, and there was this legendary Rambutan tree in his... A rambutan farm, which is famous for bearing fruits of seven flavors. Depending on which branch you pluck, the flavor is a different flavor. So how did he do that? Right? Because Mr. Lim was also a self-taught scientist, right? It's, it's actually a lot of botanists also study him. He's a very interesting fellow. So I blew up part of that picture. And this is my metaphor for Singapore. You will see on the left, right? Uh, or these, these, these three trees. I'm sure you've seen these trees in Singapore before, these types of trees. Mr. Lim was a, oh sorry, Mr. Han. Um, uh, Mr. Han was a self-taught botanist, right? And he was the one who, in Singapore, pioneered this art of what we call inak grafting, I-N-A-R-C-H. 
That means that instead of cutting off a branch and you graft it to a different tree, he, he plants two trees close together and he cuts and he connects them even as the roots are in the ground. And he can do that to several trees. So it starts off like that on the left and then slowly it becomes like this. So if you look on the extreme right, you cannot tell which is the main branch, which is the secondary branch, which is the third branch. You, you can't really tell. There's no um, um, yeah, a priority, right? In fact, it just becomes a very, very healthy and very, very good tree. And it, in order to build on this analogy, I had to read up on a lot of botany, right? And in that grafting is almost a magical thing because every tree has its own DNA weaknesses, right? Every tree has its times when it's weak and it's falling ill. But when you graft them together, they actually are very complementary. They support each other and they, it leads to a very special tree that continues to give off beautiful fruits, tasty fruits, um, and, and multiple kinds of fruits, so you're not losing yourself in the process. So, I'm, so I, I thought this was a very good metaphor for Singapore, right? Because not just for the Singapore of the old, where you have four, um, four what do you call it, the stock root, right? Root stock. Four root stocks, Chinese, Malay, Tamil, and others. But even as we accept new people, we can see ourselves as yeah, new, new, new uh, rootstock joining us, strengthening the overall tree, right? And um, which is this concept of Singapore and, and giving off beautiful fruits and making everything healthier and more lasting and more resilient in the long term. Okay? So with that positive thought, I end my presentation today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson, uh, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, thank you, IPS, for inviting me to speak at this forum on ethnic identity and culture. I have been asked to speak on the relevance of uh, ethnic traditions and ethnic identity, uh, focusing on the Malay Muslim community. On the 7th of July this year, the People's Association, Musra, which is in charge of uh, promoting Malay culture, organized the Ginta Rasa. The event held annually promotes Malay heritage, customs, arts, martial arts, music, and songs. This year, the plot showcases tensions between a Malay elderly and his grandson, who recently returned from his studies uh, from a Western university. The aim of the show was to demonstrate how Malay youths are out of touch with their cultural traditions. Now, this is a question I want to ask today. Are younger Malays really not interested in their culture and heritage? And how do we measure this? Are they less Malay if they do not speak the Malay language well or not wearing the baju Melayu? Or are these even important uh, questions? Although my talk centers on Malay's appreciation of their heritage, I also want to reflect on the religious orientation and how they affect Singapore. I'll be touching on the role of Islam in Malay traditions and culture, address the debate on Arabization and whether this phenomenon is a cause for concern. Being Malay is more than just a racial category, but many people fail to understand it. It's also a cultural one. In Singapore, yes, we have a tendency to look at issues through the lens of CMIO, and thus the comparison between categories, Malay, Chinese, and Indians. But Malays are generally a very inclusive uh, community. Uh, on a day-to-day -day level, there is a less of a need to define who is a Malay and who is not. Uh, of course, the state has a definition, it's a bureaucratic one, but I think the state's definition is also not totally alienated from the ground uh, sentiments. That's a very inclusive uh, community. In fact, um, Malays are receptive of Arabs, Indians, Pakistanis, and even Chinese who wants to live their lives as Malays. So, Mr. Zainal, if had you run for the presidential elections last year, the Malays would embrace you and accept you. <laughs> I think what is important for me, right, for those who consider themselves as Malays, first to have empathy for the community, to understand their plight, to understand their problems, and of course, find meaning in the values and the cultural practices. I think these are very important markers uh, when we discuss the Malay identity. 
The Malay community generally considers individuals who practice uh, Malay culture, find meaning in it, and speaks the Malay language as uh, important identity markers. In a survey uh, conducted by IPS and, of course, supported by China News Asia in 2017, 96% of Malay respondents rank the ability to read, write, and speak Malay, converse in basic Malay, and celebrate Hari Raya as important identity markers. I'm not entirely surprised uh, by, by these findings. Now, let me move on to the definition of traditions. In the 1990s, uh, Dr. Shaharuddin Ma'ruf, the former head of Malay Studies in the NUS, has discussed extensively the role of traditions and defining Malay identity and how they are important to progress. Tradition defines the worldview and values of a given society. It is a stable core that communities rely on as they respond to contemporary needs and challenges. Aspects that are obsolete can be discarded so this is the definition of tradition. So traditions are not mainly to impede progress, but it facilitates change through adjustments, adaptation, and assimilation, while maintaining that connection with the cultural heritage from the past. For instance, the gotong royong, or the community spirit, is important for the Malays, as much as respecting their elders. These are, these are some of the important values and principles uh, that's championed by the Malay community. With globalization, the Malay's cultural expression incorporates new elements. What to include or exclude depends on whether the person is a conservative or the person is progressive. The conservatives believe in pure forms of cultural expressions, while the progressives believe in incorporating new elements, but of course retaining uh, core values and, and traditions. Uh, the latter, of course, is more open to cultural hybrids. Recently, there have been concerns that Malay weddings are no longer representing the Malay aspects of social life. Some weddings have begun to showcase Indian dances, eh? Bollywood, uh, Korean songs, or even um, Western cuisines. But does that mean that they are less Malay? I think what is essential for the community is the community spirit of Gotong Royong where there's a gathering of families and friends to witness the important celebration of a union of a couple, and this is still celebrated and considered sacred. Similarly, one has to appreciate the evolution of Malay music and dances that have incorporated new instruments from the Middle East and the West to produce new arrangements and contemporary tunes. Conservatives will frown on these new innovations seeking for essentialized forms of Malay culture. For example, some netizens have expressed unhappiness with the state of Bazar Gelang Sarai recently, which is held every year uh, during the fasting month. So traditionally, the Bazaar is attended mainly by Malays in preparation for the Hari Raya festival, right, to buy uh, traditional Malay uh, clothes, uh, kueh and, and furniture. But the Bazaar in recent years has begun to include hybrid hipster dishes and drinks which are alien to the community. Some examples include meatballs, churros, and ratlet. Right? The presence of these hybrid products in what is traditionally a bazaar meant for Malays to prepare for Hari uh, festival has drawn flag from a segment of the community. I think these are the more uh, conservative ones. But in my view, culture has to evolve to meet modern times. And again, coming back to the definition of tradition uh, by, by Professor Shaharuddin Ma'ruf. Historically, Malay language and culture have borrowed from other civilizations and culture, just like how others have also taken from the Malays as well. Now, the Malay dictionary has borrowed Arabic words, English words, and Persian words, for instance. And this is a sign that the community is progressing. Now, the bigger concern is how such borrowing shapes the Malay mind and the overall development of the community. Does borrowing lead to exclusivism? Or, and does borrowing lead to the close-mindedness of the Malay community? I've been asked many times about the link between Islam and Malay identity. Historically, Islam played an important role in defining Malay culture and traditions. Islam has shaped the worldview of the Malays, the language, literature, and the way of life. 
The relationship between Islam and Malay culture is generally a neutral one. Islam basically allows Malay culture to flourish. The basanding or the berinai is practiced in, in Malay weddings, has Hindu origins, but it survived for centuries in the Malay community. The religious elites of the past have no problems accepting the ritual as part of Malay culture, and they consider this in line with Islamic principles. So are many art forms, such as the Ma'yong and Diki Barat. For centuries, this existed. Uh, and Malay cuisines have also survived. Islam does not stop Malays from donning the baju Melayu or the baju kurung. And some Islamic celebrations have taken a Malay manifestation. Eid al-Fitri, for instance, which is in Islam a day to celebrate the month of fasting, becomes Hari Raya where Malays use that occasion to visit the elderly, seeking forgiveness, and we don't see these kind of practices in the Middle East. In the Malay world, just like in Singapore, Idul Fitri lasts for a month. So this year, Hari Raya fell on the 15th of June, but celebrations of Hari Raya ended last week. Yeah. So the link between religion and ethnicity is not as apparent in other communities in Singapore. And the IPS survey has shown that, you know, 37.4% uh, of Chinese consider Buddhism and Taoism somewhat important or important. 70.6% Indians consider Hinduism as somewhat important or uh, important. But for the Malays, 93.3% you know, will believe that uh, being Muslim is important or somewhat important. To be sure, the issue is not whether a Malay has to be Muslim. I think this is a sociological fact that majority of Malays here are Muslims. But we have to go beyond this form of talk or analysis. I think the main, the main concern for me is what kind of Islamic orientation that we are promoting, that the Malays are championing and promoting. Are they the progressive type or are they the conservative type? Are there groups who seek to dominate Islamic thinking and force it upon others to accept their ideas? Let me now comment on the phenomenon of Arabization of Malay community. Some argue that a worrying trend facing the Malay community is that it's losing its identity due to Arabization. For instance, more Malays are comfortable wearing the Arabic garment compared to the baju Melayu or the baju kurung. Although the numbers remain small, more Malay women are putting on the niqab, the headdress that covers the face, revealing only the eyes. Uh, these costumes are generally alien to the Malay community. Um, and some have even noticed that Malays prefer to use Arabic phrases even though they are Malay equivalents. For instance, we have uh, the word hijab, which is Arabic to replace the word tudong in Malay, Eid al-Fitri compared to the Hari Raya, and shukran instead of terima kasih. Right? However, I, in my personal view, society is free to follow trends and fashion. Youths today are also influenced by Korean culture, Japanese cuisines, and Western dressing, and I think they are free to, to be influenced by the Arabic way of life. I'm more concerned about how such fashion trends could have a toll on local industries and Malay crafts, which are seen as less fashionable or religious. For me, being fashionable is up to the individual, but my concern is that wearing Arabic garments is associated with piety, or religiosity. For example, I'm concerned if someone says that you cannot lead a prayer in a mosque if you do not put on the Arabic juba or the Arabic garment. I'm also worried if you judge a woman not wearing the hijab as less religious. In other words, not being Arabs is deemed as being less Islamic. Also, I see a trend where individuals who insist right, on putting on the Arab dress and garment when attending the Malay Hari Raya function when the dress code clearly states that it's baju Melayu. I think this is a problem of the mind that cannot adjust. For me, Arabization of culture and fads is not a concern unless it leads to the exclusivist mind. Malays today are shaped by the Islamic revivalist period in the 1970s and 80s. Educated groups expose the works of conservative Muslims promoting conservative ideas, questioning the Malay adat and Malay culture. In my personal view, Malay culture should evolve and adapt in order to meet new modern needs. Yet, it is the exclusivist tendencies that may hold the community back and alienate them from their heritage 
especially when they treat Malay music, dress, dance, and arts as not conforming to Islam. The threat of religious exclusivism is a real one. Apart from what we heard in the news about radicalism, we must also be cautious about non-violent exclusivists. For instance, groups that promote alternative ideas about Islam, how it's practiced in the, in the region, will be openly criticized by these exclusivists. Such criticisms are flashed openly via the social media. There were many instances in which groups that promote alternative views on Islam were publicly named and shamed. Facing similar fate would be human rights activists and gender rights activists. I think these are more pressing issues uh, that needs to be discussed instead of asking what is, what is a Malay and whether the Malay youths or the Malays are losing their interest in their arts and dances. Of course, Malay of course, they are, it's not a homogeneous uh, community. I think a bigger problem, a bigger issue that needs to be discussed, apart from talking about them losing their culture, would be the different classes within the community. What are the middle class? What is the middle class aspirations compared to the lower class? And what is their way? And, and we also need to look at the way they understand uh, religiosity. I think uh, I'll stop here, and I look forward to the question and answers. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sasi, and I thank uh, IPS for inviting me to give this short talk <clears throat> on uh, the relevance of ethnic traditions in, uh, in the, the construction of identity, ethnic identity. Now, <clears throat> if you uh, look at me, you will see before you an Indian man. And uh, you will come to that conclusion because of certain physical attributes. The color of my skin, uh, uh, the way I look, essentially. And we tend to think about ethnicity and race in these kind of terms, which are, I think, simplistic. The idea of being an Indian, what does it mean to be Indian today, is very different from what it meant to be Indian during the time of my grandfather, or in my own lifetime that I know for a fact, during the time of my great grandmother who was alive when I was still a toddler, and I remember her and her words. To be Indian then was to be tied to a certain boundary of thought and practice and life. To be tied to language and religion in a certain manner. To be Indian was to have a connection with family, with community, with the people around you in a manner which is no longer possible in Singapore. There was a, there was a, a need to be belong to a group which we felt inherently comfortable with. And that's no longer possible in Singapore. Because for my grandfather and my great-grandmother, life was defined by tradition. By the time my parents elected to be Singaporeans, and they elected to be Singaporeans. They had the choice to go back to India if they want to, if they had wanted to. When they elected to be Singaporeans, to remain here, to, to set their roots in Singapore, it meant that they had to be committed to a different future. And the futures that were imagined by my grandfather and my great-grandmother are very different from the future 
that was imagined by my father, by my parents. And I can say for a fact that the futures that my daughters imagine for themselves are very different from those of mine. And we are all Indians, and we all come from one family. We consider ourselves Indians, we identify as Indians, but in fact, we are quite different in the way in which we regard tradition, the way in which we regard ethnicity, the way in which we are connected to language, the way in which we choose to speak and the voice with which we want to speak. They are all different. There is no commonality at all in the way in which my, grand, my great-grandmother was Indian and the way in which my daughter is Indian currently. And there has been this shift that is both conscious and unconscious. And I think the, the, the problem of casting this, this shift in the manner of anchoring it to some kind of ethnic tradition is that it inevitably would lead to a kind of essentialization of people. It would inevitably lead to a diminishing of what it is to be Indian or Chinese or Malay or others. Because really, what it is that enable us, enables us to be who we are is not just about the fact that we pick certain languages, certain ethnic traditions, certain practices, certain mannerisms, but the imagination with which we put these together and the choices we want to make about the future that we see for ourselves and for our children. That is what makes us Indian today, and that is what makes us a Malay today or a Chinese today at any one time. It is not a static concept, which can be defined or understood in terms of the ticks in a checklist. It is not something which is fixed and bounded, and which stays fixed and bounded over time, over generations. It is not independent of history. All of these notions that we have about being, being who we are, and the groups to which we belong to, all of those concepts are transient. They are shifting. They connect to certain objectives or certain intentionalities or certain ends at any one time. And they are relational. They depend on who we relate to every day in our lives. The people with whom we work the people with whom we commute, the people with whom we communicate. And it is in the vision of that present, the vision of the complexity and the diversity of that present that defines the kind of Indian I am. It defines who I am as an Indian, and the Indian who I am. In 1984, my family took a trip to South India, to the place where my father's, grand, my father's father had come from. It's a little town called Chidambaram in Tamil Nadu, which is a center of learning and culture for the Tamil people. And one of the one of the amazing things that happened to us as a family when we were there was 
when we visited a silk uh, sari shop and my mother and sister were wondering if they should purchase a sari. And they were not sure if they were being fleeced. And immediately they switched to speaking Malay. It was instinctive and unthought. They spoke in Malay. They, they had this conversation in Malay, which we all understood. And then spoke to the, to, the, to the salesman in Tamil and said, this is what they wanted. And I was struck by that, that unconscious switch to a different level of understanding and communication. And immediately I realized that as an Indian, I was a foreigner in India. This is my home. And it's a recognition of the fact that this is my home and this is the ground within which I had grown had kicked in automatically. Almost, you might say, naturally. And it is these instincts, I think, that we need to understand. And these instincts are not just decisions that are based on rationality. They run deeper than that. They connect to the heart. They connect to emotions. They connect to imagination. They connect to hopes and desires and fears. They connect to the parts of ourselves which sometimes we cannot talk about, even to ourselves. And unless and until we realize the complexity of these connections, we will get an understanding of ethnicity and race and identity which merely skits the surface of who we are as human beings. We have to understand, first and foremost, that the world in which we live in is much too complex and complicated. If I may quote James Clifford, his book, The Predicament of Culture, it is a world with too many voices speaking all at once. A world where syncretism and parodic invention are becoming the rule, not the exception. An urban, multinational world of institutional transience. Everything is shifting. Where American clothes made in Korea are worn by young people in Russia, and where everyone's roots are to some extent cut. In such a world, it becomes increasingly difficult to attach human identity or meaning to a coherent notion of culture or language because all of these are shifting goalposts. There is the assumption that culture and language is stable and fixed and unchanging. And that assumption is correct and might have been correct at one time for communities that lived in certain contexts. Perhaps for the Quakers. Perhaps for small, exclusive communities like that. But when you are looking at an urban environment like that of Singapore's, which with its open economy, with its open borders, with its open education system, with the internet, it's impossible to attach stability and fixed notions to culture, language, identity. So how do we come to terms with this? How do we come to terms with the fact that it is always transitory, it is always changing, it is always shifting? The way we, in, in ITI, the, in the Actor Training School, the, 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 the 
the methodology is to think of the authorship of identity. Who writes your identity? Who has the right to write your identity? Who is the author of who you think you are? And I think the important thing is for the individual to claim or to reclaim the authorship of his or her identity. And to understand that the writing of this is not fixed in stone, but it's something that happens again and again throughout your lifetime, over a generation, over many generations. Therefore, the essential thing is not to define the elements that go into the text, which is your identity, but to determine the authorship of that text. To determine who it is who may write your identity. And when you come to understand that identity, cultural identity, is written and it is liable to change, to erasure, and to layer, to have different texts layered on it, which is what makes us who we all are ultimately, then you come to the understanding that this writing is a fiction. This identity which we crave for, which we yearn for, which we want to fix, is fiction. It is necessary fiction. We need it, but it is fiction nonetheless. And then I think you come to a different understanding of what it is to be you and what it is to be other. And you realize that there is an inevitable connection between the I and the not I, the me and the other. And it is in this complexity, I think, that we need to find ourselves, not as Indians or Malays or Chinese, but as Singaporeans. Thank you. Thank you to um, my panelists for some quite awe-inspiring comments. I mean, as I was sitting there listening to them, I was struck by so many things. Um, Dan Fing's beautiful metaphor of the rambutan tree and the seven flavors. Um, no Cheryl's uh, idea of Malay more as a cultural category rather than a not just a racial category, and the influence of Arabization. Um, Sashi, of course, um, that profound idea of the moving present as we define ethnicity. I realized as I was listening to all of these things, I was listening to their speeches uh, through the lens of someone who has four ethnicities that I know of within me. And so recognizing that perhaps as much as through my life I've celebrated all of that, I've also struggled with it. So I feel very privileged to be part uh, of this conversation uh, because it, it really speaks to me and I'm sure to so many of us in the room, not just to our heads as academics or intelligentsia, but also to our hearts because um, reclaiming uh, the authorship of our identity surely is a personal journey for all of us. So, without further ado, can I open the floor to your questions, please? Perhaps you should just, uh, we'll take a few at one time, so that everyone gets a chance to ask as many questions as possible. First question. Okay, then maybe I'll start the ball rolling. Okay, so um, a very simple um, question for me is that we talk about uh, losing ethnic traditions and Therefore, how does that, what does that mean for our ethnic identity? Uh, and I realize that so much of our cultural expression, uh, cultural traditions are expressions of shared va values. So example, a simple example is the symbol of the egg. You know, in Malay weddings, it's a, when, we, when we are given a, the egg, it's a sign of fertility. When a, in a Chinese family, when a baby is born, 
we are giving eggs because it's a, it's a symbol of new birth. So I ask myself, if we were to lose some of these cultural traditions, do we also, at the end of the day, lose the shared values beneath them, the importance of family, the importance of life, etc.? Perhaps, um, can I ask you, Dunfing, uh, your thoughts? I don't think I have anything um, new to add to that um, compared to what I said. Uh, when, I, when I talked about traditions being one strand out of several strands that make up your identity, um, I, I was really trying to find the right metaphor. It's not a perfect one. But what I wanted to talk about was that uh, all these different things, they mutually reinforce each other, right? So if you lose your customs, you are going to the other things, language and all that all will follow. So you cannot look at everything in isolation. But if you look at culture, right? Culture is everything. It is, it's the full package. And, and it's also a bit, um, uh, what you call it? Um, you, uh, it's, it, it's risky to, uh, to try to manage it, to go from top down. Because in, if, if you were to try to um, pick what I want and what I don't want, what's desirable and what's not desirable, I think it, the consequences might be irreversible, which is something that I worry a lot about, right? Um, what is not popular today, what children don't like today, it could be the, the biggest fad in 10 years or five years. I mean, all these things change, right? So when you talk about policy, since this is the Institute of Policy Studies, what can you do when you, talk, when you look at cultural policy? Cultural policy basically is an allocation of resources. Do I put my money to build a beautiful, spanking new museum or art space? Or do I use the same amount of money and I use it to, um, for art education, right? To allow all children every month to go to a museum or to a heritage center. So where do I, where, um, where do I put that money? So it's very, very hard, I think, for a policymaker. I'm so glad I'm not one to, to make all these tough decisions. But um, one of the things that um, I remember for a very long time was when um, um, Taiwan had, uh, there was a Taiwanese cultural minister by the name of Long Ying Tai. So she was a, a, a dissident and then a, a noted public intellectual for many years before she eventually, under Ma Ying Jiu, uh, he invited her to be the cultural minister and she struggled. She wrote about it for a very long time before deciding to enter bureaucracy, right? But when she came in, she, was, she clearly enunciated how she saw cultural policy as the culture minister of Taiwan, which again is a very contentious place, right? You know the politics there. But he, she didn't, she says the role of a um, uh, culture minister or the cultural bureaucracy is not to be the gardener. I'm not the one to say what is a weed and what is a plant. What can I, how should I, um, uh, what should I grow, right? It's not. The role of the government, the role of the cultural bureaucracy is that we provide the sun and we provide the good soil we provide um, the rain, and then it comes from the ground up. We, we see what grows. That's all that we can do. Because in being forced to make that decision of what to grow and what to pull out, you might do things that you would really regret down the road, especially in, in a country where you really can be very effective in, in implementing every decision. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sashi? I, I thought Dan more or less covered everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really think you can um, have a checklist like that. You know? uh, and it's, um, as I said, it, you have to understand that what makes identity and what makes culture is imagination. It's how we want to connect to things and choices, right? Uh, and you will never know what the, what the ends of our beginnings are. We will never know that. Um, when my daughter had the chance, uh, my, both my girls are learning Malay in school. They've opted to learn Malay in school. They speak Hindi and a smattering of Tamil, due primarily to the influence of their grandparents. Not, not to us, not to the parents, because both my wife and I are purely English speaking. My wife, by the way, is Punjabi, and I'm Tamil. And if you want to look for cosmopolitanism, you can't go very far, you just need to look at home. Mine is a very cosmopolitan home. Uh, and when I asked my daughter, when she had the option of doing a third language, what she wanted to do, she said, I want to learn Korean. <laughs> and why do you want to learn Korean? Oh, because of K-pop. You know, uh, suddenly, you know, this, 
phenomenon which I had just crept in to our consciousness, K-pop, K-pop, you know, the whole K-pop phenomenon, was a central part of what's going to define, at least at that time, what is our identity as an Indian. And, you know, if I don't accept that, then woe be to me. <laughs> That's my loss as a father and my loss, uh, you know, in my relationship with her. And unless I have the, 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 the imagination to begin to include something so completely alien to me, uh, something is going to be lost in that relationship. We need to understand that, and this happens all the time. And these are the choices that we need to make. Now, of course, this is at, the, at uh, you know, to, to use Dan's metaphor, this is at the level of the ground. This is what's happening at the level of the ground. And this is what's constantly changing. And I think policy eventually has to recognize the fact that there is a complexity which they have to come to terms with. Policymakers, governments, leaders, they need to, to understand that there is this complexity uh, and, and, and come to terms with it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're getting the question and whether we are losing our ethnic tradition uh, and whether this is a cause for concern. Um, frankly speaking, are we really losing? Are the Malays, I'm speaking on behalf of the Malays, are we really losing our cultural traditions? Maybe if you look in, in terms of the cultural expressions, maybe there are signs of it. But you have to understand that, you know, in a given community, including the Malays, there's always the, I would say, so-called conservatives and so-called the, the more adventurous ones who is willing to to explore new ideas and hybrid uh, identities. So I think in the Malay community, I think uh, we see young people uh, who actually, from the grounds up, actually are promoting Malay culture and Malay traditions, Malay music, they're setting up groups, uh, Malay uh, musical ensembles. So we see this grounds up uh, kind of uh, uh, activities happening on the ground, which shows that you know, there is an appreciation of uh, Malay culture traditions. Of course, these are the more purist type who believes that there's an essentialized, what is Malay music, what is a Malay form of dances. And on the other hand, also, we also have the so-called the adventurous ones, as, as I mentioned earlier. I think the example you related to is very interesting. Uh, it's about the, the egg, the symbol of the egg, uh, especially in Malay weddings, it's called the bunga telur. Um, we don't see that often now, where actually uh, the, the father, uh, the, the host, right, uh, giving um, bunga telo to, to those coming, the attendees of the, of the wedding. Though, of course, there are still groups, uh, people who actually still practice that. But I think at the end of the day, um, essentially the value and the principle behind the bunga telo is still practiced, even though in new forms and new manifestations. Uh, and I think it's more practical, of course. You know that, you know, Malay weddings are very massive. You know, it takes time to prepare the bunga telo. I think we are all busy working and all that. So I think we have, we have come up with new inventions and innovations, but I think the principles and the values behind the bunga telo is still, is still adopted. Yeah? So I, think, I don't think we are, just because we don't give the bunga telo, that, that means that we are losing the cultural tradition. I don't think so. I think there are new forms of expression, cultural expressions. Thank you. Okay, I come from a different generation. I still miss the bunga telo, I think. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Good morning. My name is Mara. Here is a thank you for the Many of the things that uh, Mr. Sassi spoke uh, resonated with me because I went through life just like him. And uh, some of the episodes that he mentioned that also happened with me. And uh, I just recall that uh, when I was in many ways, uh, my father once called me up and told me he said that. I know that you are not going through a lot of uh, issues and things with the university, but no matter what, I just want to remind you, at the end of the day, I want you to marry a Indian girl. 
much. Thank you. Ms. Lim, is it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Hi, hi. Um, yeah, my question is, um, I suppose in, in the evolution of the Singapore culture, what, what does it really mean as a community? Just to share, um, one of my ex-colleagues, uh, she, Malay lady, dressed normally, and then one day she came to office uh, uh, with a hijab. So I asked her, uh, what happened? Did you go to Saudi or something, you know, Mecca or whatever? And then she said, actually, she felt a lot of peer pressure. If she did not wear the hijab, it would appear to others that she's immodest. Yeah? And I felt really sorry for her because I think one of the good things about being an independent country is that every single person is also independent. And if we are acting in a respectable way, it should be accepted. Uh, so I was uh, very uh, pleased to hear Dr. Sa'a mention about the Malay culture. Because yes, I, then I recall in the past when I was a young girl, I visited the kampong. Um, yeah, there were no hijabs and all around, you know. We were like wearing our like uh, sarong, kabaya, all those sort of things. And, and that was, to me, uh, the Malay culture. So culture is my other passion besides sports, yeah and technology and some other stuff. But I think that's the challenge we have. How much of our culture do we want to retain? Yeah, um, because we, when we go into the MNC, multinational, international business world, we all have to wear suits, right? And then that is an anglicization, but it's in the business world. It's a work. So we don't mind putting on some suits and all, we go for meetings so that everybody looks equitable, whether we are with the Americans or with the uh, British or, you know, any other nations. But when we are with our own people, what is it that we're trying to say when we continue to attend some of these functions in our uh, masks, yeah, or costumes? Because theatre, Yes, we go on theatre shows, you know, we may want to dress up our while, but what does it really mean? I think the challenge I find, so it's a question, what does being a Singaporean mean? Is there any particular panellists you want to address that question to? Uh, open to all, because I don't think there's a definitive answer, but it'd be good to hear uh, the different diversity of views, okay, thank so that you. the rest of us can also start thinking. Sure, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Yeah, but are there no more questions? Are there any more questions? Yes, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Zain from uh, People's Station. Um, most of the time, I, I'm engaged with the community and everybody has a separate culture. But one thing that came out from all this uh, antiquity of tradition and culture, they say that all of it are related to good luck. So how, 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 how are the factor is that means if you do something uh, traditionally or through the custom, it, it is a good sign or it is for good luck. So how true is it? Okay, we will take the first three then. Um, perhaps, um, Danfei, you want to step in? Always, always the gummy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, actually, I would yeah, just like to... Uh, answer maybe the, the, the first question about the evolution of Singapore culture. This is not something new, you know. Although we have only been a country for 53 years, I think this whole thing about identity, having a distinct identity that separates us from the ancestral cultures, that has been a long, long, long term effort and, or long term project, right? Um, my field is more in literature, so I will just talk a little bit about parts of Singapore history that many people might not know about, right? If you look in the 1940s and 1950s, in the Chinese uh, literary scene, so we're not talking just about Singapore, it's the Malayan uh, literary scene, of which Singapore was the capital, right? All the great writers were all in Singapore, or had a Singapore background, and all the stories were based in Singapore, right? So the, but we call it the Malayan literature, Chinese literature scene. There was a big debate among the literary scene um, uh, to have our own brand of literature. This whole process now, scholars call it deterritorialization. So what they wanted to do, these writers, were that they were writing in Chinese, but they didn't want the Chinese that they write to be the same kind of Chinese as what was coming out of China or Taiwan or Hong Kong. They wanted their own language. So they deterritorialized it. They deliberately, in their writing of their short stories, and there are many examples, 
um, injected a lot of dialect terms, a lot of Malay terms, a lot of English terms, not just in the dialogue, you know. They injected that in the narrative itself. Right? It's very interesting to read through now, and there are actually dictionaries published on, on uh, the Singapore Chinese Literature Dictionary, which tells you what all these terms mean. Right? What is it in Teochew, what is it in Cantonese? And some of the greatest works of today we call it Singapore literature, all came from that period when they actively and um, aggressively took the Chinese language and turned it into something that was uniquely Malayan. Right? So that whole struggle, right, that whole debate was convincingly won by those people who wanted our own language. So it's open to debate why, why we are not, we still haven't progressed much from then. Right? I think it has a lot to do, maybe geo, global geopolitics, I mean, local cultural policies, there, there, there are a lot of reasons. But um, uh, today, it seems that we are still, <laughs> uh, we, we have taken actually a few steps back. Right? But if you to look at other scenes, even in art, for example, the Nanyang artist and all that, there was that consciousness that we want to sink down roots in this region. This is our home, right? And we have to differentiate ourselves from our ancestral land. Right? So I'm glad that this is still um, ongoing. And where this goes, I think nobody knows. Thanks, Dan. So on the question of identity, maybe I... Um, Sashi? Yeah, I mean, the, um, I think the, the issue about, you know, what it is to be Singaporean, I mean, this is such a tired question, honestly, I feel. Uh, and we should move on, because I think, I think the, the great pr pleasure of being a Singaporean is that we talk, we, we, we talk about, people have mentioned the fact that you know, Singapore culture is a work in progress, Singapore culture isn't finished. Yeah, of course, I mean, that's great because of the kind of country that we are, because of our own uh, imagined future as a nation and as a people, that's what enables us to be that way. And that is what I think is the great pleasure of being a Singaporean, the fact that to put it in my terms, the fact that we can be the authors of our own identity, the fact that we can write our own culture, and that's what it is to, to write, to keep it open and keep writing. So more, instead of asking the question what it is to be a Singaporean, the questions we should be asking is how do we write what it is to be Singaporean? How do we read what is written uh, which is Singaporean. Those questions for me are much more interesting than the what, uh, you know, because uh, this is what it is to be in, in, a, in a place which is ahead of the curve in globalization, in interculturalism, in multicultural relationships, in being as open and as uh, diverse as it, Singapore is, you know. Uh, and the fact that we are living in the internet age, where really it doesn't, even if we choose to close things, uh, we can't. Information is a way, there's, there's more on this, on this on your phone today than, you know, uh, my grandfather would have been able to have understood in his whole life. It's happened over two generations. Uh, and this is what we need to come to terms with. The wealth of information, the, the overwhelming presence of facts, and, you know, and how do we deal with it responsibly as a people? How do we deal with it so that we can you know, leave something of value for the future generations? I think those are the more important questions that we need to be thinking about. Thanks, Hashi. Okay, I want to comment on the issue of inclusivity and uh, to the lady who, who asked the question, uh, I think I feel sorry for your colleague if she has to put on the hijab because of peer pressure. Well, we, of course we see that kind of instances, but there are many other who put on the hijab out of free will uh, without being pressure and because they see it as part of their ethnic identity and as well as their religious identity. But I think your observation is right that uh, you see this growing trend of people putting on the hijab, but you need to put uh, in perspective or understanding the, 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 the historical context. And I mentioned earlier in my speech that uh, we had to look, we had to understand uh, this, this rising religiosity that happened in the 1970s and 1980s in the campus, 
and we see uh, more and more uh, women uh, putting on the hijab. So you have to understand the social historical context, and you also have to understand the kind of elites that 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 uh, that we have. I think it's very important to understand. Uh, what kind of religious elites that, that we are promoting. You know, if, you, if you go to Indonesia, for instance, given the kind of religious elites that we have, I think we have a more diversity uh, of views uh, in terms of religion and also their, their identity. But of course, I also want to take this opportunity uh, to debunk a few uh, misperceptions about, about the hijab. First and foremost, hijab is not a sign of backwardness. I think uh, uh, you must there are many other indicators that you need to look at before you say that, you know, that uh, a person is backward or, or not modern. So a person could not put on the hijab and, of course, believe in many other conservative or fundamentalist views. So I think that's, that's one. And putting on the hijab does not necessarily mean that a person is exclusive, right? I think over the years, I think there's a growing acceptance uh, by the community and by Singaporeans as Dutch uh, about a woman putting on the hijab. So again, I emphasize the need yeah, to understand the socio-historical context and more importantly, the kind of religious elites and the elites that we are promoting in our society. Thank you. Um, I, I will take the, um, get the panelists to answer the good luck question, but I just wanted to make reference to um, the gentleman's um, lovely stories and anecdotes about the full circle, and I wondered whether Sashi wanted to comment on that. On what? On uh, the, you know, the gentleman who talked about coming full circle. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, <clears throat> I think that if you're a Tamil, Tamil speaking, the connection to the language is, uh, it's, it's undeniable. <clears throat> there is, there is, uh, the, the link to language, the link to the speech, in fact, the, the word Tamil itself doesn't only refer to the language, it refers to the person, it refers to the identity of the person who is the speaker. So the two are in, entwined in, 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 a, in a very deep sort of way. But whether, you know, uh, I, I regret that my, my daughters don't speak Tamil as well as my parents or me, well, I think that if I live in hope that one day they will recognize the beauty of the language. I live in hope that uh, they will want to learn the language for its beauty and for its own sake. And I think this is how everyone feels about language. This is how a Chinese person feels about the Chinese language. This is how the German feels about the German language. And unless that there, there is that deep connection to want to learn, uh, you are never going to be able to uh, imbibe the values of that culture. And, and the fact that we, we know for, for sure is that no matter how effective your education system is, it, that's not going to change. Uh, you know, if you're going to learn languages to pass exams, that's what it will always be. There will never be that deep emotional connection. And, um, but having said that, I'm very glad that my daughters have discovered Malay. And they have discovered Malay literature, they have discovered Malay poetry. Uh, and in that way, I think it is, they've been enriched in a way in which my grandparents and my parents were not. So is that, is that better? Is that superior? Is that inferior? I don't know. I really don't know. But if they are happy with that and they can live with that identity, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're really running out of time. So can I maybe ask Cheryl? I know Cheryl, would you like to comment on with what, um, you know, symbols being good luck? Symbols bring good luck. Um, what was your question? Uh, the idea of luck around symbols, right? Traditional, yeah. Yes, traditions, yeah. Um, yeah, what I mean is this, uh, every tradition has a custom. Yes. So every custom carries a certain uh, identity of it. For example, like the, um, uh, the Chinese believe that it is a custom pouring water and all that brings more good luck, more fortune. So customs carries a certain weight about, about basically trying to continue with the tradition. And if you continue with the tradition, the good luck remains in the family or in the, uh, in the city of the uh, race itself. Sasha, maybe ask Dan. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. Well, this, uh, yeah, I, I, I think this gentleman, of course, is right, and it was. Uh, I think Dr. Matthew Matthews also mentioned in the survey, right, that a lot of these customs are based on good luck. But when you talk about traditions, again, it brings back what we discussed, right? What really are traditions? Right now in Singapore, the tradition, Chinese tradition for good luck, is Chinese New Year. We we'll all go and toss fish. Right? That is not a tradition in China. Didn't come from our ancestral land. That was invented here. But here we treat it as our tradition. Right? It's something that's genuine from inside out, from bottom up. The government didn't tell us to go and toss fish. Right? We want to toss the fish. And that's a true tradition and a true Singapore tradition. So I think that's just an observation. Uh, just a quick comment. I think it's a very interesting question. It deserves a lecture separately on the, um, the practice of magic and superstition in the Malay community. I think this has got historical legacy as well during the Malay feudal era. And I think uh, Islam, when it first came to Malay society, was supposed to eradicate this, make them more modernized, believe in scientific knowledge and all that, but it didn't happen. Uh, the transition didn't happen. So you see that this is commonly practiced. Uh, presence of Bomo and all that uh, in, in the society, which I think it's, it's it's coming back to the definition or tradition is one that should be discarded uh, by, by the Malay community. So Thank you. I just, say something? I just want to say this. I mean, recently I had a conversation with an with a imam in, uh, in Singapore. And we, we, were, we are good friends. And we talked about, uh, you know, um, uh, Malay culture and Islamic culture in Singapore. And I asked him almost as a jest, you know, what, what he considers to be the greatest threat to uh, Islamic and Malay culture in Singapore. He thought for a while and said, Zain Malik is the biggest threat. <laughs> and on that note, the bell has rung. I just um, allow me to thank all our panelists. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. Uh, and thank you very much for all your questions. I think it's lunchtime, isn't it? Thank you.